Morning America. <laughs> <laughs> We are moving into week four here, Shane, and man, the first three weeks have flown by. We're already a third of the way through the season. We had some really good games last week, too. I mean, you take a look. The River ridge Galena game was really tight. Orangeville-Warren was somewhat of a blowout, but Warren made it really close there in the second half, despite Orangeville doubling them up. And then Amboy and West Carroll was another great game, and Aquin ended up pulling away, but there again, they had another close game right at the right up until halftime, and then the second half, they blow it open. Yeah, a um, couple weeks in a row where Aquin's had some close halves. But yeah, a lot of good games going into last week. We thought there'd be five. One of them didn't quite pan out that way. I'll, actually, two of them didn't really pan out that way. Um, Stockton and Milledgeville was a lot closer than the score indicated, though. Right, exactly. So, I mean, you take a look at some of the things that we don't know after three weeks. I mean, some of these teams have bounced around kind of unexpectedly from what we originally predicted. But there are some things that we do know after three weeks. First off, we know Lena Winslow is the team to beat and the, with the best shot to get to state. Yeah. Um, you know... Kind of looking at that overall picture, and I've kind of been rather blown about this for the last couple of weeks. I mean, the thing we do know is Leo Winslow is in a class of their own right now. And as far as the rest goes, um, from about here on up across is, you know, a conglomeration of anybody can beat anybody. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. So the next point is, going on to that, Dakota is definitely not what we had thought they were. Yeah. Uh, not now, anyway, I would say. They uh, really didn't uh, show up, so to speak. They're a little, <laughs> yes, little flat out the gates. Cool. And uh, Forrest and, yeah, I give Forrest some credit, though. I mean, they came out ready to go, fired up. Um, basically, for lack of a better term, played out their ass. Right. And like you said already, number three, Millersville and Stockton are definitely much closer than the score indicated. Right. Number four, River Ridge's shot of getting into the playoffs is starting it's, to look very bleak. It's done. It's it's gone. They need more. They need better line play. Yeah, and I mean we've been really drilling this home the last few weeks with a lot of teams. Um, they do have a chance this week, I think, to get back in the right column. We'll see what happens there, though. Right. Aquin is still quietly hanging around, looking for their opportunity to make the playoffs. Well, Aquin hasn't really lost anybody that they should lose to yet. I mean, they the brunt of their schedule is still ahead, and you know they play polo this week, and after that, it gets really hard. Right, exactly. Forreston is still very tough, just less skilled players. Yeah, um, we'll see what happens this week, or whether last week ended up being their Super Bowl. Um, that's kind of common when a lot of people pick against the team. They played with a chip on their shoulder. They knew they were the underdog in that game, and they didn't play like it. And EPC is still Jekyll and Hyde right now, trying to find out who they are. Can they do that coming into this week? Well, we'll find out. I mean, I'm sorry. I touched this a little bit on our social media pages. They're ranked number nine in state in the AP. They beat Amboy. They beat Dupec. And, and they beat East Duke. Um, if those three wins grant you a number nine ranking in the state, then Class 2A is garbage. And we both know that's not true, though. Right, exactly. There's a lot of great teams in Class right. 2A this year, and that's going to be a boatload of a playoff bracket. Right. Exactly. So, that's a look into what we know as we head into Week 4. We will break down our matchups right now. River Ridge at Warren. Shane River Ridge is one and two, kind of not where we expected them to be. Well, yeah. Warren's exactly where we did expect them to be at zero and three. Last week, River Ridge lost that close game to Galena, twenty-one to twelve, and Warren lost thirty-six to eighteen to Orangeville. And you take a look at that game. 
that Warren had with Orangeville, and you're like, wow, 36 to 18. I mean, it was 22 to nothing in Orangeville's favor at the half. But that was one of the big takeaways I took from that game. And it's one of the things that we kept touching on at the start of the season with Coach Teske getting these boys to play hard, fired up football, and at least be competitive in their games. And they did just that against Orangeville Saturday. Well, yeah, they did. And, I mean, you can even take it a step further back. I mean, they played back one very close in the first half there, too, and yeah. had a chance to be leading or, if not, tied at halftime. So, I mean, you like the way that Warren's going. You kind of – I wouldn't – necessarily say a winnable game against this river this week, but you know, you start looking down the schedule and see that, you know, AFC leans in the last week, that might be a game where they can see themselves possibly getting a victory. Um, but this game here should be a pretty good matchup for Warren, especially if they do play the way they do grouped up with River Ridge's weak line play. No, I agree. I mean it just that was one of the things that really stood out. Granted, Orangeville definitely they had their ups, they had their downs, um, more more ups than downs. They're, they're definitely becoming more formidable, but I have started to notice some things with Orangeville that I just don't like, and that's starting to see some kids in the middle of plays not even being engaged with the play while it's going on in process. Well, that's a problem. I mean, you gotta, you got to have it going full percentage. I mean, look what happened in week one against Polo. I mean, they gave that game away. Um, you know, they're sitting at 2-1 and one now, but Orangeville overall should be sitting at easily 3-0 out of that. Right, I agree. Last year, River Ridge won this game 32-12 against Warren. <clears throat> this one is in Warren this time. I still think... River Ridge, if they can improve their line play, they do still have an outside shot for a playoff possibility. But you start looking at their schedule, and, okay, you look at this week for a matchup. If they come to play against Warren, they should get a win, be 2-2. Two and two. But then you have Stockton, you have Polo, Aquin, Milledgeville, and then you have Hoopston in Week 9. And I think Hoopston could be a team that they could beat, but if they can't improve their line play, I don't see many wins coming in those last five weeks. Well, that's just it. And, you know, for me, going into this uh, season for River Ridge, I had them picked at 6-3. Um, that's clearly not going to be the case anymore at this point, unless something drastically changes. But River Ridge had to be at 3-0 and right now, in my predictions. It just... Had to happen. I mean, they lost against who was it? It was against Orangeville, and they also, uh, oh, uh, let me think, Galena, Galena, yeah, last week. I mean, those were teams that they had to beat. Obviously, the Orangeville game kind of got away from them, but the Galena game was a game that they probably should have been a little bit more looking at the schedule wise, a game that they should have won. And you know, it wasn't that far ago, far long ago, we looked and thought maybe River Ridge could get off to a 4 0 start, but. That's not going to be the case. And, you know, after this week, the winnable games for River Ridge really decrease. Yes, I agree. But I do like River Ridge this week. I yeah, think that sure. uh, this is the opportunity for them to get to uh, that 2-2 two and two mark. But like we've, we've stated, I mean, and I know that Coach Nicholas knows, they got to improve that line play. They do. And, I mean, you know, you can look at the schedule and it's dawning, but you can only play one game each week. You know, small focus samples, and I like River Edge as well. All right. Orangeville at AFC. Shane, Orangeville comes in with a 2 and one record. AFC comes in with that 0-3 oh record. Last week, Orangeville beat Warren. We already mentioned 36-18, to whereas AFC lost to Stockton 41-6 to after which AFC was only down 14-6 to at halftime. Last year, Orangeville won this matchup 20 to nothing. I think the things are going to be a little bit different this year. Uh, as in the final score? Yes. Yeah. Uh, AFC's got 12 points at this point in the season, you know, four points a game. Um, for easy math figuring, they either score a touchdown in garbage time or they haven't scored at all. Um, 
River had shut them out, was it, 22 to nothing? 22 to nothing. Yeah. And then they picked up a score against Dakota and running clock and, you know, Ackland led them on the boards. Similar, you know. I mean, bottom line is AFC is really struggling to get things going in the right direction. Um, I mean, it's, it's just not there for them. And Orangeville is a team that, for me personally, I want to see a, a full game start to finish where they just control everything. And they have, they really haven't done that. They're at 2-1. and one. They should be sitting at 3-0. and all. They let a, an average polo team kind of back into the game that walked away with a win. I mean, Orangeville, you're at 2-1. and one, You should be at 3-0. and all. I, want, I want to see just an all-out butt-kicking from start to finish for one game. And I think that it, it, there's a great opportunity for that here. Well, and that's one of the things with the Broncos that I've noticed. I mean, you look at, when you come into Orangeville, you look at the way they play. They play much better than they did just a year ago. More physical. They look more physical. I mean, you look at the kids when they're on the field. They look bigger. They look stronger. They look more athletic, more built. Right. You watch them play. At the beginning, I mean, they were finishing drives, finishing plays against Polo. Last week, I couldn't tell you how many times I, I've already stated, kids were standing around in the middle of the play. That cannot happen. You know, people always write us because we're, we're, we're big on the northwest side and not much credit on the upstate side. There's a reason why, and I can attest this. I've had other coaches from the small side of the conference even tell me in person at a Northwest contest, that's why our kids don't play the same way. Look at that. Right. Those guys are hitting each other, and they're what, five, six? They're, they're the five and six teams in the conference, four right. and five in the conference? Yeah. That's what they're going up against every week. And I'm tired of hearing, well, we can't compete against these teams because such and such enrollment. Guess what? It's a 1A school. You're a 1A school. If you want to win in the playoffs, you got to learn to play with these teams. If you guys don't want to vote for an alignment that brings you back geographically, you better suck it up and start winning some ball games. Uh, it, it, all start, it doesn't even start on the field. It starts in the mentality and where the programs are headed. I mean, you look at the upstate side. You've got a lot more... You know, over the years, you've had a lot more chuck and runs. I mean, River Ridge likes to throw the ball. Uh, you know, Stockton with Fox, I mean, they threw the ball. Aquin, the notorious, throw the ball. That's the type of games that the Northwest side doesn't see. And the side of the upstate that they can't stop is the power run, which the top four rough teams on the Northwest will just ground and pound you. I mean, we've addressed this issue numerous times. Even tonight, well, why isn't my team getting more votes? Because they're in the upstate. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. Right. I mean, it, and it's it's not that it's because you're just in the upstate. I mean, part of it is, but part of it's not. I mean, the upstate is still a very strong conference. I would take the upstate against the WIBC. I would take the upstate against the Prairie Land. I would take the upstate against the Lincoln Trail. Well, we talked about Orangeville last year. I'd take the upstate know, against the Little Call. You know, last year, Orangeville's playoff game, I mean, I picked them to win there, even going against a team that record-wise was much better. But you'd still like the NUIC in those matchups. Right, exactly. And Orangeville has shown more physical side that is more towards that style of the side that we're seeing. Yeah, they just need to put it all together, right. like you said. Who are picking? Orangeville. I like Orangeville, too. Shane, we've got Milledgeville at Farmer City, Blue Ridge in our non-conference matchup. Milledgeville comes in with a 3-0 and record, while Blue Ridge comes in with that 1-2 and record. Last week, Milledgeville won 34-8, to while Farmer City lost to Macomb 34-6. to This is the first meeting between these two teams. I don't think it will be much of a contest. Yeah. Um, this is one of those games where if you're the, the mechanic for Milledgeville School District, you just make sure that bus starts. You load up the players, you get on a bus, you go down, you, you put the pads on, you... Make a few people cry and get back on the bus and head on home. Stop at a nice little restaurant on your way home. <laughs> get some food. You know, just uh, really start thinking about Orangeville in week five. Pretty much. Um, 
you know, simple, simple uh, <clears throat> game plan there. So I take a look at Blue Ridge's schedule, and I mean, I I remember last year, you know, they were four and five. They're an independent team, so they gotta try and schedule games where they can. Right. Usually, what happens when you're an independent team, though, your schedule's not very strong. Right. Because you're getting other teams who don't play anybody. <laughs> right. Well, here you go. this is Blue Ridge, and. You know, their one win, you know, they beat Martinsville, which is, I compare Mount Martinsville to an Orangeville, just lesser play. You know, they're school, about 112 kids, so they're basically like an Orangeville to me, just not as good. And that's their one win on the year. South, play so like South Beloit. Yeah, just with less kids. Yes. Yeah, right. got it, basically. So I agree. Milledgeville, get on the bus. Load it up, get that engine to crank and fire up, get her nice and warmed up so you can get that travel down Route 39 onto I-74. Pull on the Farmer City, put the brakes in, get off the bus, kick some tail, get on, get home, uh, done. Stockton at West Carroll in our crossover matchup. Stockton comes in this game with a 2-1 record after they lost to Milledgeville in our Upstate Game of the Week last week, 34-8. While West Carroll comes in with that 1-2 mark after they had a <clears throat> back-and-forth game with Amboy get away from them as they lost 28-26. to Shane, last year in this matchup, West Carroll won this game 14-0. It was the game that was Lightson versus Snyder with the whole epidemic of... Right. The stock the name in their new head coach. I still feel that Coach Lightson wants to take it to Stockton just as much as Stockton wants to give it back. Yeah, I mean, you like that that clash and the storyline and everything else that was it. But uh, for me, West Carroll's just not on the level that many thought they would be or the level that they were last year. Um, I mean, they they lost a ton. I mean... That happens. I I just and for me more personally, I would say that Stockton should have a chip on their shoulder coming into this game after what just happened last week. No, I would agree. I mean, you take a look at what Stockton did with Milledgeville, and I mean, you recap that game real quick. I mean, Stock or Milledgeville's up fourteen, nothing at halftime on a kickoff return and a punt return. Mm -hmm. First quarter, second quarter. Milledgeville d did not gain a first down until halfway through the fourth quarter of that game. However, you go back to the third quarter when Carson Boyer busted off a fifty-two yard touchdown run. And then followed it up with another 60-yard touchdown run. Yeah, they may not have counted as first downs, but if he gets caught, that's a first down, right? Right. So, I mean, that game got out of hand, but it wasn't ever what it appeared to be. It was a lot closer than the score indicated, like you stated earlier. Right. Yes. And, and, I mean, West Carroll, damn near should be all three. Yes, I mean, you really take a look at their one win. Their one win came against Dupac back in week two, and it was a 6 nothing game, and they only had 137 yards of offense in that game. But if you take a look, and I've heard it already, Amboy is tougher this year than what we've seen. Right. They're playing with a chip on their shoulder with a different type of edge. And like you stated, West Carroll's not where we thought that they were. They did lose a lot, you're correct, but they do still have a lot of talent. It's just trying to get it all together. But they're going to come in against the Stockton team, like you said, that is very hungry, out to prove that, hey, we're not getting any respect here. We've won this conference six times out of the last seven years. We just got our tails kicked in by a team that we should have beat that we were 9-1 and one against over the last 10 years, and we did it. They gave it to us, a game that we both picked correctly. Yeah. But 
you know, Coach Steiner's doing great things with Stockton still. And like I said, and like you stated, this that game was a lot closer than the score indicated. This game's going to be tough. I mean, West Carroll's still a fighting team. But I think that's exactly where Snyder's starting to get Stockton to become more physical. Right. And, you know, you did say West Carroll. You know, West Carroll needs to go into this game with our backs against the wall mentality. It's week six, you have Dakota. Seven, I think they followed that up with EPC, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. And then they have Forreston. Um Prematurely, I don't see a victory in any of those games. Nope. Um, so there's potentially five. I mean, bottom line is West Carroll has to win this game. This mm-hmm. is a must win for West Carroll. It is. I, however, just don't know if they're going to get there. I mean, Stockton's going to get the Dvorak machine rolling, maybe. <clears throat> I have to agree. I think Stockton's primed to take this game this year, and I think they're ready to do it. Now, I agree with you. I like Stockton. Dakota at East Dubuque, Shane. Dakota comes in with that 2 and one record after a 40-20 loss to Forest Hill last week, while East Dubuque comes in with a 1-2 and two record after they got shellacked by Lena Winslow, 51-13 as expected. Last year, this matchup, Dakota won 41-26 after they got rolled by Forreston. This year, they come into this game after getting rolled by, by Forreston. Yeah, they didn't show up. <laughs> it, Dakota needs to respond big time here. Um, you know you're not going to get any points from AFC. you, you got to get six wins. Um, the schedule is very favorable for the Indians moving forward for the next four weeks. Um, but they need to show some life here, some urgency. Um, really start that, get that line playing better and move the ball. I mean, Forrest and swallowed it up. Um, they just came out flatter than flat. And you look up, it's 14 nothing. Then typical Dakota fashion here of late, we just hang our heads and <clears throat> cry like little babies. You know, that's one of the th- down, that's one of the sad things I see in Dakota is they put their heads down as soon as they get behind. As soon as they face adversity, they're done. They're done. And that's not the Dakota teams we knew of in the past. And if these guys are really trying to get out there and put the Dakota way forward and get the Zuya going, they need to put out the fact that, hey, just because you're behind – does not mean that you're done. I mean, look at the 2011 state championship team. They were behind in nine of their 14 games. Yeah. And they were down by two scores in no. the semifinal game, the state championship game, and who knows however many other games. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, I mean they, they got they rolled by Forreston in week two. They, didn't care. they got rolled by Aquin in week three. Yeah. They rebounded, beat both those teams on their way to the state championship game. Right. And, you this know, is not the Dakota team of the past. No, and, you know, I'm sorry, but AFC and Galena did nothing to prepare this team. I mean, no, this, the schedule was very favorable. And these next four weeks are kind of going to give these guys a false sense of accomplishment here, so to speak. I mean, you're... Let's face it, Dakota should be 6-1 and one going into that Week 8 with EPC. And we're going to sit here at Week 8 and probably pick Dakota because they're doing great things and all this and that when they won't have played anybody. I mean, I really need to see something that makes me think that this team can have a chance against that Week 9 matchup moving forward. Well, here's the thing, and I'm going to break down East of Butte because – if I'm East Dubuque, I look at what we had success with last year, and that was the pass game. Warriors, forget your run game. You're not running against Dakota. You might as well just stick to the pass. Throw the ball, get right back in the shotgun, sling it all over the place. Throw the ball, throw the ball, throw the ball. That's how you can beat the Indians, because they still have not proven to me that they can stop the pass. But they haven't. They but they haven't played a team. Yeah, I agree. They have not played, and that's and where is, that. This is where you and I will differ on that. Their pat to me, their pass coverage. I mean, we haven't seen it, right? But it should, it be, better. should be leaps and bounds better than it was last year. But here's the thing: they haven't seen it. Right. Element of surprise. Right. Can you get them going up? Have they played a guy like Lane Boyer yet? No. Right. 
I mean, they did in Forreston, but they didn't pass, they didn't pass the ball. Well, they didn't need to. They just got on the well, ball. Well, when you run for 500 yeah. yards, what's the difference? I mean, yeah. So, <clears throat> this is going to be that game. Will Dakota rebound, or is it going to be a debacle like last year and they struggle to a win? Right. We need to see what that character is. Right now, I agree with you. Have not seen it. Dakota's got to bring it in order to right. prove it. Because right now, I am off the Dakota train. Yeah. Because they proved me exactly what they were when they lost to Forreston. Nope. They still can't win the big games. Well, that's just it. I mean, last year I sat here and said they couldn't be a junior high team. And until they prove otherwise, I'm right there again. Um, I do like them on the road this week. I don't think it's going to be as big as boat whooping as it should be, though. Right. No, I agree. I do like Dakota in this matchup, but I would not be surprised if it's similar to last year's contest. Shane, our next matchup takes us to Pacatonica, where Amboy will come into town to face Dupec. Amboy comes in with a 1-2 and two record as Dupec comes in with an 0-3 mark. And to be honest, Dupec coming in with the 0-3 mark after what we saw in Week 1 it's kind of a surprise, and you really look at what they did in week two. They had a win get away from them. But last week, 11 yards of offense. Wow. Yeah. Um, by the way, while you're thinking about that, that gives Dupac 287 yards of offense through three games this year. Well, and that's, that's just it. Um, he, well, and I know this. <laughs> I know this is rather cliche. <clears throat> But you have to score to win. And the problem is, you know, Dupac played their hearts out week one. Um, you know, they should have probably beat West Carroll. My point is, you can play on heart. And you can wear your heart on your sleeve. You know, get that grit and mentality going. But if you don't get the results, that kind of fades a little bit. You can only play so hard and so close. And eventually the mental wins aren't there anymore, and then the lack of actual talent starts to show. You know, we've been ranting and raving. Dupac is on the way. Um, the first two weeks showed that. And, you know, they lost to a, a better team in EPC. It doesn't derail what they're going to be next year or the year after that. My point is that this Dupac as to how they played against EPC is more of the Dupac that we kind of figured they were this year. So to me, Dupac's performance against the EPC is more in line with where they at rather than what they were the first two weeks, if that makes sense. No, it does. I mean, you take a look. They lost to the EPC 36 <coughs> and then, To be quite honest, you can take a look at it in two ways. Dupac's where we thought they would be. They are who we thought they were. Exactly, Coach Green. <laughs> but at the same token... EPC is 3-0, and and they're exactly where we thought they would be. Yeah. Now, you take a look at what EPC did the first two weeks, and their first two wins were more astonishing right. than what week three was. So, you could take a look at it and say EPC is on their way to being where they should be. Yeah, and that is what that is. However. We'll, we'll get to that in yeah. a minute. Um. But then, you know, you got Amboy. They they get a victory against West Carroll, which they've kind of had the Thunder's number. Big win. And, uh, yeah, they have. You know, you get Two the ball, out of three. Now. Right, you get the ball rolling. The problem for Amboy is you still got the big hitters yet. I mean, yeah, they lost the EPC in close game. You still got Dakota. You still got Forrest. And you still got Lena Winslow. Um, if you are a clipper and you're thinking about the playoffs, <clears throat> you got to steal one of those three wins. Yeah. Or one of those three losses. Um, I like them against Dubek. I'm going to throw that out there now. But I don't know where they get to knock on the door of the playoffs. Four and five is not a good question. No, four and five looks like the legit area where Amboy's going to finish. Granted, we had him at three and six to start the year. I two and seven. So well, maybe. you did. I had him at three right. and six. Collectively, we had him at right. three and six as a whole. Four and five is obviously a step forward in the right direction for Amboy. Could they make it possible? Absolutely. I mean, like I said earlier, they're playing with a chip on their shoulder. Right. They have a passing attack that is actually working, as you'll find out later in our segment. 
But if they can keep piecing things together and keep playing with the chip on their shoulder, albeit not the stupid way, and by stupid I mean giving penalties right. that can cost you, but if they can keep doing that, I mean, things are looking up for Amboy going into the further part of the season. Now, like you said, you run into teams like, you know, I know, right? Problem Throwing pens everywhere. You run <laughs> into teams like Lena Winslow, Dakota, and Forreston, though. That's where the problems are going to be. But I do like Amboy in this game. I see Dupec going to 0 4. Galena at Lena Winslow, Shane. Galena comes in with that 1 and 2 record after they beat River Ridge last week, 21 to 12, a game that I picked incorrectly. You got that one right. Good job there, buddy. Galena Winslow comes in with the 3 and 0 record, exactly where we expected it to be. Number one state ranking as well. They beat East Dubuque 51 to 13. If you take a look at what this contest was last year, it's basically the East Dubuque score is 54 to 12. Yeah, it wasn't very close. You know, Galena really hasn't had much to talk about the last couple of years. They went winless last year. They get their first win and snap that was a 13, 12, 13 losses in a row. <clears throat> um, yeah. Bottom line is uncharted territory for Galena. You know, they got a good win against River Ridge. Um, you know, I'm sure they're not – I mean, yeah, you're happy to win, but you look at the program in a whole, and you probably never thought you'd get to a point where you're celebrating wins over River Ridge. And, you know, you get to feeling good, okay, this is something we can build on, and then, bam, in come the Panthers. <clears throat> tough, uh, tough game. Yeah, it, it, it's a smoke show waiting to happen, basically. I right. mean, you come in, you're going to get all revved up, you're going to get high and mighty and blah, 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 and then all of a sudden the Panthers take the field, and the wind sets out, and here come the Panther train rolling through. Right. Um, you know, Lena Winslow just does a lot of things great. Um, defensively, look at that, you know, that line. Um, we could literally just take this and put it on repeat for the next how many weeks that we talk about Lena Winslow. You group that up with what they have in the running game. And, I mean, it's going to be a long night for the Pirates. <clears throat> well, I mean, I'm not going to tout up Lena Winslow too much because I think some of it's getting to them already. They still have yet to prove to me that they can play a four-quarter ball game. Well, in all intents and purposes, they haven't really played a formidable opponent that's going to test them that way. No, they have not. And you got to hold that to them. But you take a look. In week two with Forreston, they were not there in the second half. We're not there. Forreston started taking it to them. Forreston was better conditioned than them. The same things that we've been talking about for the last – this is our third year in a row talking about it. Well, and that's, I mean, I don't know if it's, I think we can agree here. Leo Winslow, as good as they are, is not as good as they were last year. No. If they think that they're going to coast to a state title, they better get that there right out of their head. There is a reason why we have not seen a back-to-back -back championship in how long? Ever. Do the math. Think of all the good teams we've seen over the years. The 2011 Lena team, injury or no injury, late in neck. The 2009 Dakota team, late in neck. I mean, it's very hard to do. It is. It is. It is hard to do. I agree. Galena was once one of those teams that was up there in that echelon. Mm -hmm. You always were geared up, ready to play Galena. Two years ago, you said it does not take long for that to fall apart. And we're boy, in year three now. Boy, did it ever. And it has fallen way off from where we thought it would even ever get. It. I mean, you don't even think about it anymore. You nope. don't even think about Galena being a powerhouse anymore, which is... Nuts. You're waiting for that comeback. Right. You're waiting for it. And waiting for it. And it's not coming yet. Can it come? I absolutely think it will come. But how long are we going to see this go on from Galena before it comes back to where right. we were? Where we saw it for 31 years. Who puts up a run 31 years of not missing the playoffs? But four times in that time well, span, never in back-to-back -back seasons. No, and while you're 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 right in the midst of that with the Lena Winslow program, right? 
I mean, basically, Lena Wenzel has taken the throne from what Lena was. And, you know, I don't doubt that at some point down the road, Lena Wenzel will face the same challenges. I mean, that, that's what happens in 1A public schools. It's in waves. Lena is just on a high right now. I mean, uh, huge saw, high. I mean, we saw the early 2000s with Dakota. Yeah. I mean, and we've seen where that's gone. I mean, this is the way it goes. Lena, butt kick it. Yes, I like Lena one's a little big. Our upstate game of the week takes us to Polo Shane, where Ackwood comes in with a 3 0 mark, and Polo comes in with a surprising 2 and 1 mark after that week one upset we've have we already talked about with Orangeville. Yeah. Last week, Aquin came through with a win, 41-6 to on AFC, where Polo came through with that much-expected win over Metro East Lutheran, 49-14. to Last year, Shane, this game was also our Upstate Game of the Week feature. This game was tied at halftime, 0-0, until Aquin blew it open, 28 to nothing for the final score. Yeah, um, seems like a long time ago now, so to speak of it. Um, an Aqua team this year, new, young, new coach. I wasn't real sure what we were getting. But to me, this is exactly where we thought Aquin would be. You know, this is the gimme part of the schedule, so to speak. So they give Aquin credit for everything they've done to this point. Um, trying to get to that 4 0 mark that's very crucial for Aquin. Um, they still have that crossover with Forest and next week. Um, after that, you got Orangeville. River Ridge, Stockton, and Millersville. And, you know, going into the season, we looked at that River Ridge game and it's kind of like, you know, okay, maybe that's a problem. But, you know, I like the way the Aquins playing. Um, get to 4-0, and all, take your chances with the remaining games. Um, but first, they got to take care of Polo. But, and Polo is one of those pesky teams where if you don't put them away, they <clears> kind of <throat> will linger and have a chance to win. You know, I like Polo. They're playing with a chip on their shoulder, as they should. This is their last year in 11-man Football. You know, I, I, I agree with you. I like, I, I do. I love the way Polo is playing. They've come out, they've proved our expectations of what we thought right. they were wrong right from the get go. But, I mean, they are. They're playing with a chip on their shoulder exactly the way they need to be playing. They're playing in football the way football is supposed to be played. Brayden Solto, Brady Webb, Tucker Mumford, you can go down the line. Mm-hmm. Those guys, all of them are playing as a cohesive unit, and they're making things happen for themselves. Right. Now, that's something that, sure, Aquin's 3-0. and They're sitting pretty right up here on the board. They're exactly where we expected them to be. Right. They're, they're not anywhere where we never thought that they would be looking at their schedule. Well, and, and the hard part to do this on our part, you know, we try to do as best a job as we can on these teams. And... And we'll it's, admit it's, we're wrong. It's impossible to see every team before we make a prediction. So, you know, box scores and radio broadcasts and talking to this person and talking to that person is all great. But until you see in person what they are, it's really hard because I can't sit here and tell you what I fully expect out of this game having not seen Aquin play. Well, there's only one person I trust with you in a game, and that's you. When I break down a game... And I hear what you have to say. I trust that. When I talk to other people, there's some I trust and some I don't. Right. But I know that we're through three weeks now. And between the two of us, we've already seen 10 of the 17 teams. And we're going to take some more off of that this week. Right. So I challenge anybody who thinks that they've seen more teams play than me and you. Right. Stand up here and give us their predictions. The way it is, um, yeah, I mean, I don't disagree. It's just, it's hard to sometimes. But, uh, you know, after this week, we'll make it 12 out of 17, which is pretty darn good. Um, Considering we're only four weeks in the season. Right, with a, with a good <clears throat> chance of seeing everybody by the end of the year. Oh, yeah. So, I definitely, based off of our schedule, we will grab all 17 teams which, within the course of the regular season. Which has never happened before. It has so, not. We made it a part to make it happen. Right. <clears throat> and the way the schedule has fallen this year has been great. It has been. And, you know, it's just one of those things where, for me, I really wish I'd have seen Aquin before this game to know where I'm at with them. But I do like the Bulldogs to keep rolling because they know it's at stake here. I agree. 
Akron is at the right part where they need to be. And if you take a look at Polo, so are they. Right. Both of them need this win. Both of them still have an outside chance to make the playoffs. Very well, Akron is very – both of them are sitting very good for that. But I do like the Bulldogs as well in this matchup. Our Northwest game of the week brings us to Forreston once again, where they will play host to EPC. EPC comes in this game with a 3-0 and mark. Forreston comes in with a 2-1 and mark. Shane, it's the exact same records these two teams had in this exact same matchup just a season ago, where Forreston won 30-18. Last week, EPC beat Dupac 36-0. Forreston beat Dakota 40-20. This one is set for the making. What do you think? Well, yeah, I guess looking at that score last year, I didn't realize it was that close. You didn't ever really thought about it. Well, well Forreston had time. control of the game the whole time. It right. just was a sloppy game. Uh, you know, playing at Dub City and Forreston, it's a really hard place to play for EPC this week. Dub City. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you look at EPC's three games and – Kind of lackluster, so to speak. Um, they get by East Dubuque, whatever. I don't even remember that score. Um, what was it, 28 nothing, maybe? Yeah, 28, 28, 20, 28 nothing. Should have okay. been like 52 to nothing. That's what you would think. Then they squeak by Amboy, and then they put a shellacking on Dupac. That tells me one thing. I'm not trying to be mean or anything. That tells me that I don't have a clue what they are. <laughs> I agree. And to be Both honest, these teams. And to be honest with you, I don't have a clue what Forreston is. They got shellacked against Lena Winslow. They played a Dupec team to a 6-6 tie at halftime. Eventually had control of the game. And then they go to Dakota and they play off their ass. And that might, for all intents and purposes, be their best game all year. I don't know any different. It wasn't a might be. It was their best game all year well, to, to this, this point. point. But I'm saying collectively moving forward, that might have even been their best game all year. I mean, we haven't been high on force, and so, you know, people hear us talk and give them extra motivation, or we don't mention kids in articles or whatever the certain circumstances may be. Whatever fuels their motivation, every team has it. Well, and I mean, it's one of those things. You can go back to our Northwest preview show way back at the beginning of August, and we very clearly stated that Forreston is not the team that they have been the past three to four years. They don't have to be, though. And no. It's okay. They don't have to be. But what do we say? They are still a playoff team. They are still a formidable opponent. Yeah. They are definitely sure. a team not to look over. Well, that's just it. What part of that is not good? Right. You're a playoff team. Well, How many teams make playoffs? 32. There you go. Well, the thing for me is, you know, watching that forcing game and watching them the first couple weeks, this is a team that I thought... By the end of the year, you do not want to be playing them. Right. No, because I, agree. I only see them getting better and better and better. If that continues to happen, the rest of the playoffs could be a Forest and Cardinal show because if they build off of that game against Dakota, I would love to see a rematch with Lena Winslow down the road. No, I agree with you. And here's the thing, too. Yes. So they've lost the big shows. You've lost Barklow. You've lost Fox. You've lost Braden Walton. You lost AJ. You lost whoever. You lost everybody. Hell no, it got graduated two years ago. They felt that for a while. Oh, gosh. Yes, they did. But here's the thing with it. They're still playing forest and football. Yeah. You take a look. Yeah, okay. Diddick's gone. Zick's in. You can't tell. Zick is still playing Diddick Forest in football. You can't tell. Exactly. And boy, did they ever show up last week. Yeah, I mean, it was it was kind of what you had expected them to do against Dupac, in a way. I mean, it was nice yes. to see. Um, I don't have any reason to pick against them this week at all. I don't. I mean, yes, EPC's great. Yeah, they're ranked number nine in state in Class 2A. Forreston has jumped up to number eight in Class 1A. More likable of where I would see Forreston right. being. Absolutely. I'm a little surprised at EPC's ranking. Yeah. I think EPC's getting ranking because they're in the NUIC, which is fine. That's fine. I'm good with that. They don't 
and they have not proven to me that they are a 2A state ranked team yet. If they, they win, win this game, sure. Sure. I agree. But they got to win this game. I like Forrester. I like Forrester at home, too. All right, so now we're going to go to our Player of the Week segment, Shane. And we had some good c competition here for Player of the Week. I mean, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight kids that were on our nomination ballot. We're going to walk away with two of them as our Player of the Week contest. Yeah. Number one is going to be Mitchell McLaughlin and Boy. Comes in last week, 17 of 26 passing, 302 yards, three passing touchdowns and a rushing touchdown for four total touchdowns in their win over West Carroll. Yeah. He's going to need a plane ticket to get up to Lena to get his prizes, but, you know, <laughs> great game on Friday. Yeah. So, Mitchell McLaughlin, great job. Excellent game. Um, if you watch us, which I think that you do, and if you can't make it to Lena to get your prizes, just let us know. We can make sure that they get mailed to you. UPS. Free. Something. <laughs> we'll get them to you. Just let us know. Zach King of West Carroll. Here we go again. West Carroll once again. Having a big defensive performance. It's ironic that both of our player weeks come out of the same contest. But in a 28-26 ball game, big game, big right. plays. Zach King, 29 tackles, 16 solo, one sack, one forced fumble. Heck of a defensive effort. I mean, look at Week one with uh, Sullivan. What yeah. was it, 22 tackles? 22 tackles. I mean, uh, these are a couple of kids who are just flocking to the ball. I mean, 29 tackles. Good God. Well, and that's like I talked to Coach Lightson about it. I'm like, man, you guys are really getting after it defensively. He goes, man, these guys fly to the ball. And I agree. I mean, we knowing that about West Carroll. They yeah. get around. They do Absolutely. fly to the ball. The thing is that they're just not as uh -oh. big. Right. right. So, I mean, great performances, no doubt. Huge performances by both players. Both of them will receive Player of the Week t-shirts, Player of the Week medallions, and a pizza voucher of coaches. Uh, brought to you by our sponsors of coaches and hometown trophies. So, great job, fellas. And uh, good luck uh, moving forward. All right, so that gives you a look at our week four matchups and previews. Shane, we got a good slate of games ahead of us right here. I think we got a very good Northwest and Upstate games of the week setups as well. A couple games that we could see definitely going either direction. You got some other ones that are pretty much a lock in place. Yeah, I see. Um, three for sure, maybe a fourth game that could be close. Uh, you know, the one game that sticks out to me is that Stockton West Carroll game. You know, if this was a, not a crossover, it would be a game of the week. That For is, sure. That is definitely a, a game to watch. Um, unfortunately, we're going to lose this matchup next year when everything gets thrown into a hat and redone. Um, but, you know, I, I love this matchup. Like you said, the games of the week speak for themselves. Akron and Polo, EPC at Dub City. I mean, it's just great. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a great week. We're going into week four. I'm really looking forward to this week to yeah. see where we're at. We still got some separation to make here, obviously. Yeah. Um, I mean, we're going to see some of these teams. They get to that four loss mark. They're basically flirting with playoffs or no go. Well, that's just it. So, I mean, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I mean, then, you know, even looking forward into week five, I don't want to look forward too far, but man, week five is going to be gonna lit. Be barn burner. It's going to be lit. So, lit, lit. Anyway, got to the games this week. Lots of great games to get to. As always, root for the NUIC.